Welcome to the first video of a three-part series on the Dynamis Method. In this series, we're going to teach you how to regain control of your life, find freedom from porn, and live in that freedom without the need for filters, accountability software, or avoidance behaviors. Now, here's why that's important. Because the reason that porn is so hard to overcome is because it is such a unique struggle. It's not quite the same as drugs or alcohol. I mean, could you imagine like if an alcoholic could get a shot of whiskey from their smartphone? How difficult would it be for them to stay sober? But porn is challenging because of what we call the three A's. Okay, It's accessibility, affordability, and anonymity, which is a hard word to say. Okay, But it's anonymous, right? The reality is because porn is everywhere... And it's so much easier to conceal than other types of addictions or problem behaviors. It makes it uniquely challenging to overcome. This is why the solution to the problem cannot come from outside of you. Okay, what do I mean by this? But simply, much of the advice around the treatment of pornography addiction is only focused on behavior modification. The primary strategies for helping you stay away from porn is changing your environment to reduce triggers, giving you distraction techniques for when you're triggered or restricting your access to porn completely. None of these strategies work. Here's the bottom line. You will never be able to fully escape porn, and it will always be an option for you if you really want it. That's just the reality in today's world. And that may sound discouraging to you at first, but here's the good news. You don't have to use those methods or keep yourself away from the opportunity to watch porn in order to be free. Okay? In fact, as I'm going to teach you, a much, a much better strategy is learning how to be comfortable in any circumstance, even with full opportunity, and be able to say, I don't need it and I don't want it. This is why I say the solution has to come from within you, not outside of you. I'll get to this even further in the final video, the within approach. <clears throat> if you are completely dependent on outside aid to keep you from watching porn, what will you do when you're faced with an opportunity to watch it? Because that will happen at some point. Your brain will go into hyperdrive and tell you this is a rare, can't-miss opportunity. We have to take it. It's going to be tough to say no to. On the other hand, if you come across that same opportunity, but you've had full opportunity to watch porn every day for the last year and simply made the choice not to, that opportunity will be no big deal to you because it's no different than any other day. right? So this is why this approach works better. You can find yourself in any environment under any set of circumstances and you have within yourself what it takes to make the choices you want to make. So I'm sure at this point you're thinking, okay, that sounds great, uh, but how in the world do I get there? Well, that's where we're going to begin here with the above approach. So what if I told you that porn wasn't as much of a problem as you think it is? Now, what do I mean by that? What, what if I were to tell you that what you think of the problem is more of an issue than the problem itself. So let me explain. Abraham Maslow said that if your only tool is a hammer, then every problem looks like a nail. So in other words, if we're looking at the issue with a narrow lens, we may fail to correctly identify the problem and may use the wrong tools to fix the problem. I often tell my clients that porn is really only 5 to 10% of your problem. When I was struggling with my porn addiction, I would obsess over the neuroscience around porn addiction. I wanted to know why it made me behave the way I did and why it was so powerful over me. I later learned that while that information is fascinating and true, it's not what's most important and it's only minimally helpful. Okay? As it turns out, people don't just run back to porn time and time again because of neurochemicals being released in their brains when they're triggered. It's actually far more complex than that. There can be a million different reasons that porn becomes someone's vice, and we'll get into that more in video two, the below approach. 
But what's important to know here is that the reason you choose to use porn each time is not just because of the neurotransmitters in your brain. In fact, once you've allowed those hormones to take over, you've probably already moved past an important step. So let's take a step back. You may or may not know that for the last 80 years, the primary treatment modality for all addictions has been the 12-step model. What you may not know is that this model was not developed scientifically and it hasn't been updated or scientifically scrutinized since it was first developed. The very first step in the 12-step program is to admit powerlessness over your addiction. Now, why would you want to do that? The reason this was the basis of the 12 step was because they wanted people to lay down their pride, stop trying to do it themselves, and surrender their struggle to a higher power, while also learning to lean on others around them, you know, such as the group or a sponsor. And this made sense for the format that they had, but it also set in motion a shift in thinking about addiction that gave addicts this victim mentality and made them feel feel as though they were completely helpless in their struggles. But newer research has found that empowerment actually improves outcomes for individuals recovering from various addictions. So that means what we now know is that it's better for you to learn how to feel empowered in your struggle against porn rather than feeling like it has complete control over you. And that may not seem true at all to you right now, but we'll get there. Because the reality is, you do have power. You just have to learn where that power is and how to use it. Okay? So let's take an example. All right? This is exactly what I teach my clients in any session that I'm in. First thing, I teach them these skills. Okay. <clears throat> example A. We often think that our feelings and our reactions are a direct response to our circumstances. A circumstance happens and we react a certain way. We feel a certain way towards it and then we respond a certain way towards it because of the circumstance. So let's take an easy example. All right, somebody cuts you off in traffic. Well, I'm angry. Okay, I'm angry, and so I respond by yelling, honking my horn at them, getting road rage, perhaps, right? Now, I'm angry, and I honk my horn, and I throw a fit because you cut me off in traffic, right? That's normally our thought process. I believe that I'm angry because you cut me off. But there's actually another step in here. So if we look at the model, I call it the CTFA model. Right? We have circumstances, down lower we have feelings and actions, but in between those things there is another step and that is the thoughts. So between your circumstances and the feelings and actions that follow, there are the thoughts that you have towards your circumstances. Now sometimes these thoughts are known to you, sometimes they're conscious thoughts, sometimes they're unconscious, subconscious, sometimes they're just assumptions and beliefs that you bring into the circumstance. But they're always thoughts that you have towards the circumstance that they create your feelings, which eventually create your action that you respond. Okay, so looking at the car cutting you off in traffic. What would be the thought that you have in that circumstance? Well, the thought is, that person violated my rights. That person put me in harm's way, right? That was wrong of them, right? Those are my thoughts. Those are my assumptions. Those are my beliefs in that moment, which is exactly why my response is anger, which is then why I also I have the thought that I'm justified to retaliate, that I need to have some kind of justice in this situation, which is why I feel entitled to blow my horn at them, to have road rage, to, to retaliate in some form or fashion, to let them know that they've done something wrong, right? And all of that flows out of these thoughts and these beliefs that they have done something wrong and they have violated my rights in some way, all right? Now, those can be true, right? I'm not saying that those thoughts are not true. Sometimes we have thoughts 
that are true and not helpful. Sometimes we have thoughts that are untrue. All right. But what we can do in these situations is we can always replace these thoughts. We don't have a lot of power over our feelings. You know, we've, we've tried to control our feelings before, and it's difficult. It's very difficult. But what we can control is the thought. And what we can do here is we can insert a thought in place of those thoughts that is more true and more helpful. Okay, so if, if we're looking at a... Uh, you know, an instance where somebody's cut us off in traffic, right, what would be a thought that's more true and more helpful in that situation? Well, the thought could just be as simple as, well, nobody was hurt and everyone is safe, right? That's a true thought and it's a helpful thought, right? And if that is your thought, now how, how are you going to feel in response to that thought? You're not going to feel as angry you're going to feel more calm. You're going to feel gratitude. You're going to feel relief, right? And so your actions are going to follow those feelings, and your actions are not going to be nearly as aggressive. Now let's take this same model, and let's put it in the context of trying to overcome pornography. Now we often take this same idea and feel that we are powerless over the circumstances, right? We get triggered and we just feel helpless, right? We feel like, man, we've got to grit our teeth and we've got to distract ourselves and just get away from that trigger, get away from that urge. <clears throat> but you have power, okay? So let's, let's just think of a, a common scenario. All right, let's say you are home alone, feeling lonely, Nobody's around, and you're innocently watching something on TV, all right, and let's say an ad pops up, right? Uh, even Netflix has ads nowadays if you don't pay for the premium, right? Ads are always going to be a thing. <clears throat> so an ad pops up. It's not even an explicitly sexual ad necessarily, but there's a very attractive woman on there who's showing some skin, right? So, boom, your mind is triggered. <clears throat> now you're feeling aroused, you're feeling an urge, and all of a sudden you, you're realizing that you're home alone, you have the opportunity to watch pornography. Maybe say there's a device in the home that you have access to that you could watch pornography, and, and all of a sudden the realization is there. And now you're triggered, you're feeling aroused, you're feeling the urge. Opportunity is there. <clears throat> and you think, well, not much point in fighting. I know where this is going. We all know how this is going to end. Right? If those are your thoughts, what do you imagine that your, <clears throat> your feelings are in that situation? You're probably feeling somewhat... Uh, powerless, you're, you're feeling somewhat apathetic towards the fight, uh, you're feeling, uh, obviously you're feeling aroused, you're, you're feeling, um, you know, a sense of need for the pornography, <clears throat> and so what is the most likely action that's going to follow? You're just going to go and you're going to take, take the opportunity, right? You're going to watch pornography. So let's, let's backwards, let's wind backwards here, and let's go take that thought in the circumstance, or in this exact same circumstance. Let's go at the very moment of seeing the woman. Okay, You see the woman on the screen. Now, your, your first thought before was, wow, you know, that's an attractive woman, and... I want to see more, right? Now, you might not think that consciously. You probably don't most of the time. But that's kind of the underlying thought there. That's kind of the underlying assumption. When you see an attractive woman, the thought is like, I want to see more, right? So what if you just capture that thought? What if you just pause that thought and you, you challenge it? <clears throat> now, ask yourself, what am I being promised 
by the more. If I were to look at more, what would that be giving me? What would I be getting from that experience? What is it trying to sell me in this moment if I pursue that? Okay, and that can be a myriad of different things, right? Maybe just in that moment, it's curing your boredom. Maybe just in that moment, it's curing your loneliness, right? But you also have a, an assumption there that you don't have any choice but to pursue it further because, well, you know, here I am, I'm triggered, I'm home alone. What We all know it's going to happen, right? Well, that, that right there is a thought, okay? So we can take that thought. We have the power to replace it. So let's take that thought and let's put a different thought in there. More true, more helpful. Well, I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. Right? That's a true thought. That's a helpful thought. So if that's true, then let's just ask the question, what do I want to do? Okay? Now, you may be thinking, well, I would probably really want to watch porn in that situation. Well, do you, though? Okay? Let's not make that assumption either. Again, let's ask, what is pornography selling me in that moment? Even if I have the opportunity, okay? Your brain is telling you that it's just an opportunity. You've got to take it because it's an opportunity that you, you don't get, right? You don't get the opportunity. Okay, but let's just say, okay, even if I have the opportunity, say, say I always had the opportunity, what about it would make me want to go do that? Okay, what is it providing me? All right, and is that a payoff for me? Is it actually going to follow through on its, on its promise, on its sales pitch, right? If it's promising me a relief from stress, if it's promising me a relief from boredom, if it's promising me just pleasure, right? Is it actually going to follow through and provide me with what it's promising me to the point that it outweighs the negatives. Okay? So put that thought in there and weigh that and honestly evaluate that. And then knowing that I don't have to do anything I want to do, making that evaluation, you might come to the realization, I don't want pornography. So even in that moment, you can look at it and say, look, with this opportunity in front of me, even though I have the opportunity, I don't need pornography, and I don't want pornography, and I don't have to do anything I don't want to do. So there is nothing that is making me do this right now. All right? Now, if that is your thought, and that is your belief, how are you going to feel compared to before? Right? You're going to feel more empowered. You're going to feel more in control. You're going to feel more motivated to go and make the choices you want to make in that moment. Right. So this is what I'm talking about where the way you think about your problem is more of a problem than the problem itself. Right? Because if you've gotten into this victim mentality where you feel like it's just completely in control of you and you have to fear it, you have to just avoid it because, man, if you just get triggered at all, you're done for. Right? That's not true. You have the power over it. You just have to adapt your mindset towards it and reclaim that power and realize that you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. And maybe you don't even really want to do pornography. Maybe you don't want to use pornography. Look at pornography nearly as much as you think you do. Like, allow your brain to reevaluate the reward of pornography itself. Okay? Now, there's a, <clears throat> a few important principles here in, in my method that you have to take with this skill moving into the process of recovery, all right? So number one is is defining what recovery even is in the first place, okay? Now, I do not believe in the concept of recovery being linear or recovery being this idea of a extended period of sobriety. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean streaks, days counting a, a number of days without a relapse. Okay, now why is that a bad thing to do? Very simply, uh, because it's not very realistic for most people, uh, but also because what happens if you go 21 days without 
a relapse, and then you slip up one day. Now in your mind, you're back to day zero. If you're on day zero, what are you going to think in your head? You're going to think, well, what's the point? It's day zero, right? So the next few days, you're more likely to lapse again because, well, I've started over, right, in your own mind. But that's not actually how recovery works. You don't start over just because you have a relapse. You've made all of that progress, and then it doesn't just automatically start back to zero because you have one lapse, right? But if you continually relapse over and over and over again, then yeah, you're going to have a big setback, right? Now, what if you had a different mindset and say, okay, we expect some bumps along the road, but we're always moving up. We're always moving forward, right? So you go 21 days, you have a lapse, you keep going. You go another 21 days, 42 days with only one blip right in the middle, right? It's 42 days with only one setback compared to the way you did it before. Right, so that's why you have to develop a different idea of what recovery is. It's not this magical number of days you go because, I mean, you could go a year without looking at porn and be a day away from relapsing, right? You could go a year without looking at porn and still be addicted to it. The thing is, recovery is not just going so many days without relapsing. Recovery is completely changing your relationship with pornography to the point where it no longer consumes your life. It no longer controls you. But you control yourself. You feel in control of it. And you feel free. All right? And that process takes place over time, even in the midst of relapses. And so what that means is you have to believe that relapses are a part of recovery. And relapses have to become a learning opportunity for you rather than feeling as if it's this terrible thing that sets you back doesn't set you back it's an opportunity for you to learn and get better which means it's absolutely necessary for you to reduce shame anytime that there is a relapse reduce shame show grace for yourself and learn as much as you can from each relapse so whenever you do have a setback you have to hyper analyze those and, and use this skill set okay what was the circumstance what were my thoughts in that circumstance that led to me being provoked? What feelings did I feel in response to those thoughts? And then what actions followed, right? Do that retroactively. Examine that after the fact over and over and over again. And it can be a little strenuous at first, but the more you do it, the more automatic that process becomes. It's like walking a path, right? At first, when you walk a path through tall grass it's very difficult but you walk that path over and over and over again and it becomes very easy because a path clears and that's the same way your mind works so it's, it's going to take some effort at the beginning to utilize these skills and change these thought processes but eventually that becomes much more automatic because your brain wants to you know it wants to um, make things more efficient right constantly wants to make your brain more efficient. So I would suggest stop counting days, start thinking of recovery as more of a, a bumpy, awkward, upward slope that is progressive, having more of a growth mindset towards recovery. Uh, <coughs> and then another uh, very important thing um, as well would be to Another uh, important thing as well would be to change your idea of what accountability is. So uh, accountability is not meant to be something that just looks over your shoulder to catch you when you've slipped up. Um, you know, the, the, like I mentioned a minute ago, like one of the most important things is to reduce shame because shame actually keeps you trapped and it actually leads to more acting out. It seems as though like guilt and shame should motivate us to change, but it doesn't actually. The more shame there is, the more we tend to act out, and it creates this cycle actually of creating more demand for the acting out, for the pornography usage and, and then other unhealthy behaviors. And so we can step out of that cycle actually at the point of, of the shame. right? And so we don't want accountability that brings on any shame. And guilt. 
we want accountability that supports us and encourages us. And so an accountability partner should not ever be a spouse or, or a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Um, an accountability partner should be someone who is not biased and doesn't have any personal, um, you know, any personal stock in your life necessarily. Um, I mean, obviously, it's, it needs to be somebody you trust, but nobody that's going to be personally offended by your issue, right? Because then it becomes their issue whenever you are discussing these things with them. That's why it can't be your spouse, because then you you talk about these things, you talk about your struggles, and then all of a sudden it's hurting them personally, and it's becoming their issue. And all of a sudden you're talking about how it's affecting them, rather than focusing on you, which is what you need help with. Like, you need somebody that's going to help you instead of it being somebody that you're constantly have to, to go in and help them with how it's affecting them, right? So that's why it's not good to let it be someone who has personal stock in the issue. Um, and it also needs to be something that you really take, take ownership of yourself, right? It's not just, I'm asking you, hey, to keep me accountable, right? Hey, will you reach out to me regularly and, and ask me how I'm doing? Will you check up on me? Um, that's not what accountability should be. Accountability is, hey, can I rely on you to be a trusted partner, right? And then I'm taking my own responsibility for my accountability, meaning, um, you know, hey, if I realize I'm in a vulnerable situation, I'm going to reach out to my accountability partner and say, hey, and just let you know this is a situation I'm in. I just uh, wanted to make somebody aware, right, just so somebody knows, so you can check up on me later, right? Things like that, like, uh, hey, man, I... I've been uh, in a slump, you know, the last week. I feel like I'm kind of regressing a little bit. Uh, just just want to talk talk through it with somebody, right? Like having somebody that's willing to be there for you, not asking somebody to take on the responsibility of being your parent, right? That's not what an accountability partner should be. And that's the reason so many people lose accountability partners. And it's hard to keep accountability partners is because, you ask people to be your accountability partner and they do it for two weeks and then you never hear from them. Well, that's because that's, that's too much to ask people. That's not, that's not the role that they should be having. It should just be somebody that is willing to be there when you need them. Okay? And then I, I don't think that you know filter software and this, these accountability softwares and things that you put on your phones and tablets and computers, I don't think that they're beneficial. Right? Now, you know, people may disagree you might need to figure out what works for you personally. Here's the reason that I don't think that they're beneficial. There's a, a psychological phenomenon called reactance, okay? And what this is, is this thing that you see in children and teens and even adults, I mean, we do it too, uh, where when you tell somebody that they can't do something, that just makes them want to do it even more, okay? And so what's going on in that situation is, you know, when there's something over there that is just there, right? It's just it's just there as an option. Your brain just sees it as an option. But then all of a sudden when it's it's restricted and there's perimeters put around it and it says, no, you're not allowed to do that, all of a sudden your brain puts more value on that thing. It says, well, if it's being protected, it must be very valuable. There must be something special about that, right? Like if you're, you know, in a museum and you, you go and, through all of these um, exhibits and seeing all of these things and you know you probably assume they're somewhat valuable but then all of a sudden if there's one with a box around it and it's got this security system on it you're like well that one must be especially valuable right because they've got it restricted they've got it locked up which makes you assume that it's more valuable than the other ones right so that's the assumptions that your brain makes when we get restricted from things our brain places more value on that thing and it makes us want it more which is why whenever you're not allowed to watch pornography, whenever that freedom is taken away from you, that just increases the desire for it. And so even just that seeking behavior, trying to navigate your way around the filters and find the opportunities for it, that itself can be more enticing than the pornography itself. And so that's why I'm a big advocate of just allowing yourself the opportunity so that it's just normal, it's just available, and those opportunities don't just catch you off guard, um, and that doesn't become the more enticing thing for you. And then that reduces that reactance, right? That reduces that thing inside of you that 
makes the pornography seem more appealing because it's that cookie jar on the top shelf that you're just not allowed to have. And then when you finally get, you know, the cookie jar down where you can reach it, it's just so hard to resist dipping your hand in there, right? Um, and again, I, I just, I don't think that they work because they're, they're really easy to get around. And like I said before, you will never be able to escape porn. If you really want it, you will find it. And even if you don't want it, it will come across your life at some point. You will be triggered. You will see something sexually arousing. Like it is, it is so prevalent. It's going to be there. And so I, I really strongly like suggest not using accountability software or filters of any kind, but making the choice every time to do what you want to do in the face of those temptations and triggers and things in your environment. Um, obviously not intentionally putting yourself in harm's way. You know, I, I don't suggest hanging out around strip clubs and, and going in, in vulnerable situations that are extremely vulnerable um, and watching a lot of movies with nudity, things like that. But, like, you can live in freedom. You can live your life um, without needing to be completely restrictive and shut yourself off from the world because that really just serves to create more of that tension inside of you that makes you want it more. We, we crave freedom as human beings. And, and I think that that just increases the desire for, um, for the taboo thing itself when we don't have it. Okay. So <clears throat> to review, the, the above approach is really about changing your mindset towards pornography and giving you the skills in the moment to, regardless of the circumstance that you're faced in, being able to take control of your thoughts in the moment, identify what is the thought that I'm thinking, what are the assumptions that I'm bringing into the situation, or the beliefs that I have that are making me lose power or give in to the sales pitch that the opportunity is giving me, that the pornography is selling me, what are these thoughts that are creating the feelings, the urges, and things that are pushing me towards pornography, and just pausing and observing those thoughts and challenging them and replacing them with thoughts that are more true and more helpful. Thoughts that are going to push us in the direction of the actions that we want to take. Okay, And this can apply across the spectrum of your life, but it's especially helpful for helping you gain control in the moment of an environmental trigger. And that keeps you from having to kind of hide yourself from the world and hide yourself from triggers. It doesn't matter what comes your way. You just have the opportunity to say, okay, I realize that's there, but you know, what is that going to give me? What is that going to do for me to pursue that even more? You know, even if I could look at porn, even if I have the opportunity, I don't really want it. I don't need it. And I don't have to do anything that I don't want to do. Right. And so in the next video, we're going to talk about how to completely eliminate even the demand for pornography. Because the thing is, even if we give you all the tools to, to take control over it, right, and we, we eliminate the behavior, if we don't get rid of the thing that drove you to pornography in the first place, that made it so appealing to you, that made you become addicted to it, then you're just as likely to fall back into it again in the future, right? Because that root is still there. It's like going and cutting down a tree, but leaving the stump, right? Those roots are still alive, and that thing can just shoot right back out from the stump, right? So we want to find the root, and we want to kill the roots and take care of that, and then that eliminates the demand for pornography so that you don't even desire it anymore, you don't need it anymore. And that's what we're going to do in video two called the below approach. Can't wait to see you there. Mm -hmm.